بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So, did you guys have a good New Year's? Right? Alhamdulillah. So this is an interesting time of the year, I think, for all of us. It's interesting because there seems to be like a, a shift that happens, like a collective uh, or an awakening of some type, you know, our, our collective conscience is wakening up around the end of the year, every year it happens. Um, and people start, I think, questioning, you know, their, maybe their lives, their choices in the previous year, what they did, what they didn't do, their goals, and maybe even their own mortality, right? You start, I mean, every year that passes, you're a year older. So I think you just start facing, um, facing those questions that you're avoiding all year long. Uh, and that's why you have this thing that happens every year around this time where everybody suddenly wants to be better and they want to, they have all these resolutions and they start planning and making all these changes. So it's a really interesting time of year. From the spiritual perspective, we should be doing that type of self-analysis not once a year, right? Not at the end of every year. When, how often should that happen? Every single day, right? So every single day we should be going through this, you know, process of really thinking about what we did during the day. You know, and this is called muhasaba, right? Where you actually are taking yourself to account. You're looking back from the start of your day. How are you? First important question. The most important question that if you want to, at the end of every day, that you're, you know, in bed and you're thinking about, your day, what's the f most important thing that you should be thinking about first? Right? How was your salah, right? Right? Oh, you, you want me to put this one on too? Okay, sorry. <laughs> sure. Okay, this one, the clip is not working here. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know if I can figure this out, but I can hold it. It's not even on. Oh, wait, it's on now? Oh, much louder. Okay, mashallah. So, yeah, the clip is broken. I don't know how this will work. Let me see. Actually, hold on. Maybe I can do this. Yeah, okay. Got it. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. So, our prayers, right? Um, the most important thing that we should be looking at every single day, the beginning of the day but also at the end of the day I mean if you're doing the evaluation process at the end you want to look at how are your prayers right that's the most important thing why is that the most important thing Yes. Absolutely. I mean, if your prayers aren't there, then yeah, you can't really hold on, right? But to your point, you know, the very first thing that we're all going to be asked about on the Day of Judgment is what? is our prayer. This absolutely is the most important goal that we should have every single day, right? Beyond everything else that we're doing. If we're, and as most of us are, I'm sure we all wear different hats, right? We're wives, we're daughters, we're sisters, we're mothers. We wear many different hats and we end up doing a lot and we're juggling a lot. We have a lot of responsibilities, right? Some people are very good about keeping their responsibilities in order. They like to-do lists. How many of you have to-do lists every day? You work from a to-do list, right? Mashallah. So you keep yourself organized, which is very good. Some people are just on autopilot, right? It's just like, I don't know what's going on, but I know I got things to do. You know, and you're racing back and forth, you know. That's, a lot of us are like that. We're on little sleep, right? We're barely getting enough rest and nutrients, but we're just going, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the dunya is always pushing us to meet, you know, all of those worldly goals that we have. And they're important. Nobody's 
denying taking care of your family, taking care of responsibilities, working, whatever it is that we're doing. Those are all important. But the goal of every single one of us here should be to make certain that whatever is happening in our lives, that it does not interfere with our prayer. Because it is the reason why we are created. None of this other stuff matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for one reason and one reason only, which is to worship him. So if we're not, um, you know, doing well in our prayers, that's the first thing you want to look at if you're not finding yourself uh, satisfied in your life. If there's things that are happening, um, you know, you have a lot of problems, tribulations, hardships, you want to look at your prayer. You want to evaluate from that standpoint. Like, how committed am I to my prayers? Am I kind of just not really there, half-heartedly doing it? Am I not doing it at all? Am I missing prayers? You know, but look at that because I, you know, for, for, for sure, if you're having any, um, as I said, issues in life, a lot of times they can be, you know, connected to, to the prayer. So, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, this time of the year, this is what, you know, people are doing everywhere all around us. Um, and, but we should be doing this every day. And that's the very fir first thing that we should be looking at. But I wanted to talk about this concept of, you know, of happiness, because that's, you know, what so many of us are, uh, are, are striving for, right? We're all striving to be happy one way or another. Um, that can come from our relationships, it can come from financial pursuits or career pursuits, whatever, but we're all, we all want this concept of happiness. And so we have to you know, stop and ask ourselves, whose definition of happiness are we, uh, are we committed to, right? Um, because if you look at, we talked about this yesterday, I had a session here, some of the people in the room were here yesterday too, but we looked at this, you know, idea of happiness, and it's interesting because research shows that the more people, you know, strive for happiness, and we're talking, you know, this is, you know, research done by, uh, by scientists, so it's not Muslims that are doing this necessarily. But they found that the more people pursue or try to pursue happiness, something interesting happens. What do you think it is? They become unhappy. So as we are pushed in this direction of wanting to be happy, researchers find that if that's your focus of this, you know, you know, word happiness, and that's all you care about, and you're, you know, um, what happens to most people is they start isolating other people in their lives because the way that our world defines happiness is a very selfish, self-centered pursuit, right? It's all about me, me, me. It's all about what I want. And so what natural, naturally what happens is if you start getting in that you know, frame of mind, you're going to alienate the people in your lives. You're not going to feel a lot of fulfillment from whatever it is you're pursuing. And so you end up seeing that as people make that their number one pursuit, they actually end up um, with low, uh, you know, sat life satisfaction. So that's interesting, right? Because it's like, how can that happen? Well, it's again, because what is your definition of happiness? If it's to get, to have material wealth, to gain things, to acquire things, to acquire power, to acquire uh, relationships, you're likely going to um, go down that route. But that's not the purpose of our creation, right? As we said, our, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to worship him. And if you look at our entire faith, every single aspect of our faith is to actually give us the most fulfillment that we can possibly have in this dunya, right? Everything. That's why our faith is not just a belief system, it's a way of life. If we actually commit to following our faith the way we should be, by following the example of the Prophet said, um, the byproduct of that, the natural consequence of that, is that we will have the true meaning of happiness, right? Which is what? 
because there's happiness that's fleeting and it's just an emotion, but true happiness is what? Hmm? Is what? Exactly. The true meaning of happiness is rida with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? To have so much peace in your heart that the whole, nothing phases you in this dunya. That is actual happiness. Everything else that is sold to us on a daily basis is a lie. It's an absolute lie, right? It's a lie that money will buy you happiness. It's a lie that beauty will be, make you happy. It's a lie that even your relationships are going to fulfill you. That's not true. Yes. Please. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Right. About money and about all the other conditions, mm. but only this truth, which is the freedom, which is the truth, and as the Muhammad, you are guaranteed to have the truth. MashaAllah, Jazakallah Khairan. Beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Absolutely, everything she said. Subhanallah. But you know, we're still um, we we're sold this idea again that, and it's not just from the society around us, many of our cultures, our family members, they tell us this from a very young age, get this, you'll be happy, everything will be fine, everything will be perfect. And uh, a lot of times we realize, you know, that's not what happens and you end up having tribulation and problems and difficulties and challenges. And what happens? You know, this is where shaitan just jumps right in, right? Because you thought if I, you know, I know, for example, many sisters will come to me and say, I made a stakhara, you know, and I married someone, and I, I did everything right, it was halal. Why am I so miserable? Like, my marriage is not good. I'm not happy. Because they were told that if they do everything by script, and if they make a stakhara, it's like a magic potion, and everything will be fine. This is not true, right? So sometimes it can be even, you know, from our cultural or religious, you know, people in our lives might distort reality, but we have to accept that this dunya is not a place where we should put an expectation of happiness. It's not. Happiness is an emotion that's going to come at times, like when you have the birth of your first child, inshallah, or, you know, yes, on your wedding night, inshallah, most of all of us hopefully are or we're happy. Um, there, there are times where happiness can come to your heart, but if you ever believe that you're going to be just fulfilled always and have this constant satisfaction in life and nothing is ever going to come and, you know, affect you negatively, this is where you set yourself up for a lot of disappointment. But what we're seeing is that, you know, this is what's happening. So many people are not really clear on exactly what is, uh, you know, what, what our purpose is here and what the relationship that we should have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So they end up, you know, it's like I'll, I get really close to Allah when things are going good, right? Or when I have a, a need, like when I'm suddenly desperate. You know, subhanAllah, you get a call from your doctor and there's a diagnosis. You know, potential diagnosis that you're, you know, like the, the blood tests are coming and it could be, you know, something terrible. Now all of a sudden everybody, you know, Prayers go up and phone calls are being made. And can you do a khatam and this? And we, it's like we have this very, you know, interesting idea of what our relationship is with Allah. Like he's just on call when we need him. Right? Astaghfirullah. And that's not how it works. We're here only because it's a blessing from him and a gift from him existence. But 
the, the real purpose, and this is where we have to really come back to our understanding, the real purpose of our creation, subhanAllah, and this is where we have to be so grateful to Allah, is so that we have an opportunity to strive for eternal happiness. That is the ex purpose of our existence. Allah created us. He has no need for any of this. He does not need anything from any of us. So there's no nothing for him in this. It's entirely for us. So when we think about the pursuit of happiness, th literally is existence and following our deen. That if that if you really want to be happy, that's how you have to convince your mind that the only way that I will have a true understanding or a true experience of, of happiness is if I commit myself to this deen and I follow it with that, uh, you know, that full intention and full heart. Because anything else is, is you know, you're going to not have satisfaction in life. You're going to, you know, um, fall prey to so many uh, traps of shaitan because that's what he does. He's our... He's the greatest enemy, right? And so his purpose is to take away our faith little by little, right? Step by step. And he'll work on us. Every single one of us, he'll find those weak spots, those blind spots that we have, and he'll start chipping away at us. And so that's why we have to step back and say, you know, what can I do to protect myself from his traps? And again, the answer goes back to your faith. The Prophet Sallallahu if you look at his entire existence, he didn't leave us without a solution for really anything. From the beginning of, his, of the day, we have dua that we say. Throughout every single moment, there are reminders, there are remembrances, there are actions that we should take to protect ourselves. That's why like, an awrad like this is so important, because there's protective duas in here. You know, there's du'as in here that will protect us. But he didn't leave us without, you know, some means of achieving uh, protection and happiness and safety and security. All of it was given to us. He completed his message very generously. No other faith is as comprehensive as Islam. You will not find in any other tradition what we have. We have an incredible gift in our deen. And an incredible gift in the, in the example of the Prophet Sallallahu as I said, from the beginning of the day, when your eyes open, we know what to say, we know what to do. Our very first movement out of bed, you know, you go to the restroom, you have a dua. You come out of the restroom, you have a dua. You know, you put on your clothes, there's dua to be said. You go to prepare your breakfast, you say dua. You eat your breakfast, you say dua. You finish your, it's like subhanAllah, every single point of your day, He's given us, you know, things that we are supposed to be doing for ourselves. It's not, you know, for any other reason. He didn't need to do those. He was already, he already had visions of his, you know, place in Jannah. He knew where he was going. It was guaranteed to him. He was even given an opportunity to leave and, and just go. But he remained because he wanted to give, continue to give to us. So now we have to ask ourselves, so here, I, here we are. It's 2020, New Year. How much of his sunnah are we really putting into practice? Like, think about it. You know, how much of his sunnah are we really putting into practice? Do you know all the du'as, your daily du'as? Why not? Isn't that sad? How can we face him on the Day of Judgment? I think about that all the time, all the bala. How can we face him? And he did so much for us. He, he would wake up in the middle of the night weeping for us. And we didn't even bother to memorize du'as that he gave for us. But I bet you all of us know lyrics to songs. Right? We have a lot of things memorized that we don't need, that benefit us, that don't benefit us at all. We committed to do those things. But yet, subhanAllah, what the Prophet Sallallahu has given us, it's like we don't, we don't see the value of it. We don't see the value of it. And that's tragic, right? And then we wonder why we're not happy in our lives. That's the paradox. Like, isn't it obvious? You're not happy because the, the very means of attaining happiness in this dunya that Allah designed 
to be a place of tribulation, to be a place of difficulty, to be a place of turmoil and sadness. Every single thing that he gave us to protect us from being harmed by the dunya, we're not doing. And then we wonder why we're feeling the effects of the harms of the dunya. Right? Logically, there's a clear disconnect there. And we have to go back and ask ourselves, well, that's what it is. If I'm not fulfilled in my marriage, and yet uh, there are people, for example, Asia, right? Let's look at the women before us. They were sent to us as examples. She's the wife of Fir'aun. Who was her husband? He was the greatest tyrant in existence. Fir'aun. He massacred people. He was a horrible, wretched human being. How was a wife of that man able to attain the status of being one of the four perfect women? How? If it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and her commitment to her Lord. Right? You can be married to someone in a relationship that's toxic, but still be protected from that. You know, and that's what Islam is. Islam is the refuge. Islam is the eye of the storm, the hub, right? When you're practicing it correctly, it will shield you from all of the fitna of the dunya and help your heart so that you're not faced. And that's why there are people who come from really difficult places in the world where they, all they saw was bloodshed. They've seen the, you know, horrific, the horrors of war and just, you know, oppression and things that we can't even fathom. But subhanAllah, if you meet them, they have a smile on their face. You know? How is that possible if you've come from that type of a background? Right? That you're not affected with PTSD when so many other people crumble at, at certain traumas, right? And it's, it's just the nature of dunya. PTSD is real. There are people who suffer from it. And I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that there are people who can be in situations of horror, but they can come out, you know, almost like unscathed. Like they walk through the fire and nothing's happened to them. How? It's because of their ego. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and continue the discussion. Um, right, before, right before you left, I was just sharing a story about my teacher. But my point in sharing that was to say that there are people who have found um, the secret, right? They have been given this immunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that enables them to withstand a lot of difficulty and challenges in this world that some of us have never been through. The loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, uh, real you know, calamities and tribulations, physical uh, health issues. How do these people do it? It's because they have found, again, what we all, we all have access to, which is they're committed to their deen. They actually are following it the way they should be. They take their prayer seriously. They take following the Prophet ﷺ sunnah seriously. They, uh, you know, they do remembrance of Allah. They read their Qur'an. They do their salawat. They do their daily athkar, their du'as. They try to keep a state of wudu. They have good relations with people. They uh, serve their parents and their family. They fulfill their rights and obligations. They honor the elderly. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, mashallah. So good to see you. Um, so this is, you know, it's it's all there. Everything's in our deen, and the Prophet entire life is so that we can model it. So that's why we have to say it is absolutely possible to find contentment in this dunya despite problems, tribulations, hardships that are inevitable. We will suffer. We will have loss. We will have grief. People will betray us. It's just part of life. It's going to happen. But how do you, again, build an immunity so that it doesn't break you down, so 
where the where you're depressed all the time, you're miserable, you're uh, you know, you're taking medication or or, or medicating, self medicating with other things that you shouldn't be doing. You just look again to our tradition. So I was just that was the I just wanted to finish that point. Now <clears throat> what you have on the on or what I've written on the board here is something I wanted to share with you because I really think lists are helpful. When you have uh, something to to recall easily, it can it can help stick. You know, it has that sticky factor. So I like lists. And if you study, you know, life satisfaction, it's very much tied to again, so you know, an individual's definition of happiness. So that's why when you look at people who have low self esteem, one of the first uh, qualities that they possess is this feeling of unhappiness, right? And so you want to think about that. If you are in a place in your life where you're just not feeling good about yourself f for whatever it, it, reason, is it personal? Is it, you know, your relationships? Are there problems you're dealing with that you don't know how to manage and cope with? Do you have health problems? There could be a variety of reasons, but if it's leading you to this conclusion where you're just not uh, feeling good about yourself, you might want to again reevaluate uh, where your what your definition is of, of or what your expectations uh, are of this dunya. Because if you can accept that this is a place of difficulty and challenges, but I can find a refuge, and that's where I need to put my focus, then inshallah you can slowly come out of that. But just to you know, I wanted you to see it for comparison, right? People who have, again, low self-esteem, they not only feel unhappy, but they also have anxiety. They have, you know, inferiority, superiority, complex issues. They're impatient. Uh, their goals are always about other people. There's no internal, like, desire to become better. It's always about making other people happy or trying to get validation from other people, approval of other people. It's a very external thing. And then negative, just in a constant state of negativity, right? The, all of that, all of those qualities are indicative of someone who ha is having, you know, there's a spiritual disconnect. Because if you are, again, following your, your faith the way that you should, and following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is to protect you from all of the things on the left, literally. Everything in Islam is to protect you from the things on the left, right? Because if you follow your, your faith, as we've been saying, it will encourage all the other qualities. And we'll talk about now the second list there. People with high self-esteem. Look at the qualities that they possess. The first one is so telling. You're responsible, right? If a person has high self-esteem, they take things seriously. They take their responsibilities seriously. And this is one of the first, you know, objectives of, the primary objectives of our deen is to make us responsible people. We have goals every single day that we should be achieving. Our prayers are daily. It's not that, oh, you just say them once and then you're set, you know. You have to commit. You have to take your wudu, your prayers seriously. Uh, and make your world revolve around your prayers, not the other way around where you're just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I have to pray. But you're doing other things. You're shopping, you're going you know, to the movies, you're listening to music, you're watching Netflix, and then it's like, oh yeah, I have to pray. No, it should be, I have to pray and I'm going to schedule everything else around my prayers. So if I have to you know, go to this event, well, where am I gonna pray? That's how your mind should be you know, that's how it should work. Where it's always the forefront of your mind is your ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So responsibility is a, is a characteristic of someone who is, again, they have esteem. They know their purpose. They know why they were created. And this is what we're all striving for, isn't it? Don't we all want to have high self-esteem? Everybody in this room, right? Everybody, we all wish we were confident, you know, high achieving, uh, high, you know, producing self, high self-esteem people. Well, let's look at what it takes to get there. You have to be a person committed, and that's why number two is connected to that goal commitment. You have to have goals, right? 
you have to look at your your life and not look at it like it's a done deal. It is what it is. This is my life. And, you know, that's all shaitan. If shaitan's got you in a place where you're just complacent wherever you are and you think, like, I'm just destined to be a housewife. I just cook and clean all day long. Um, and I, you know, clean up after the kids and my husband. I have no other internal goal of my own. This is unhealthy. And it's not, this is not what our tradition teaches. W women, we're multifaceted. We're, be, we're more than just uh, mothers and wives. Our first role is servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our very primary, uh, you know, that's who we are first. All of the other things come secondary. But if you don't see that as a, a part of who you are, but the domestic and material uh, roles that you play all, you know, define you, and you don't think of, well, how can I learn better? How can I become more, a better servant of God? What, what do I need to learn? We should all know our fardain, you know? And many people in our community, they don't know their fardain. It's not because there isn't access to knowledge. You're, we're in a community center that, mashallah, has programs constantly. There are, we are the envy of people all across the world. I'm telling you, there are people who envy this community because they, our center is so active and they wish they had a place like this where they have scholars coming and teaching all the time. So if you don't know your fardain, which are what? What are your fardain? Which, which, what are the primary things that every... Every person should know. Every Muslim should know. What are we responsible to know? We're responsible to know our fiqh of what? Tahara, right? You should know how to clean yourself, right? There's certain things about, you, you know, knowledge that everybody should know. You shouldn't have that knowledge. Your prayers, right? You should know how to pray. You should know how to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody in this room, we should all, at this age in our lives, we should all know Tajweed. We should have studied that, right? Imam al-Ghazali considered studying the diseases of the heart also a fardahain. So if you've never studied the diseases of the heart, I'm not, I mean, I'll have, I have to make a plug now. I have a class tomorrow. You are welcome to come and join. We're starting a six-week class based on the book, Purification of the Heart. This is the book. If you've never studied it or read the book, this is by one of our greatest scholars of all time, Imam al ghazali considered also something every Muslim should know. You should know what plagues the, the spiritual heart so that you protect yourself from it. But again, these are sciences and these are st disciplines that we have to take seriously. So, you know, wherever you are in your spiritual path, you want to ask yourself, I need to always be looking to grow. So wherever I am, I need to find the next step. Like if I haven't done my fiqh, I need to do this. If I haven't, you know, but kind of just start putting down those goals. That's the better, you know, New Year's resolution than thinking about how many pounds you want to lose you know, or, you know, cleaning out your closets. Like, people get stuck on these ridiculous trends because it's popular and everybody's Instagram is blowing up and social media is talking about these things and it's, like, cool. But all of that is, means nothing if you don't have your, your, these things in order from a spiritual place, right? Yes? <laughs> no.
No, thank you for mentioning that. No, Jazakallah khairan. I appreciate that because I want I, I you know I don't come to this group often, so I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. Of course, and we have to pace ourselves. And I'm I'm speaking really to the people who have. Uh, it's not even a matter of of uh, convert or not. It's a matter of your mindset. So you could be, you know, in this you know faith for 20 years or one year, it doesn't matter. But if your mindset tells you you're good where you are, that's what I'm challenging, right? Because we all need to be looking at ourselves as works in progress. And that's why goal, setting goals is very important. And again, it's, you know, it's clear that our deen is, pushes us constantly to be better, right? There's no part of our deen that says, oh, once you've arrived at this level of knowledge, it's good. You're good. You know, just no. You, you have, you know, the masters in our history who were always, mashallah, even though they had achieved incredible feats, you know, memorizing the Quran when they were young or all six volumes of the Hadith or, you know, mastering this science or that science, they were also, guess what, mathematicians and medical physicians and, you know, they studied law and they were philosophers and it was never just enough. They kept wanting to grow and cultivate themselves into being the best versions of themselves. I think modern, you know, the message, unfortunately, is that, you know, once you kind of arrive at a certain point, you, uh, especially in some of our cultures, I think there's a hierarchy or a priority that's off. It's like everything about your family first, you got to cook meals every single day and you have to vacuum the house every day. And, you know, and it's like, what? All those domestic things are, are great, but if they're hindering your spiritual growth, that's not, that's not great. Your spirituality is a very important part of you. Don't deny yourself those things. Don't deny yourself. Mashallah, I just had a sister come up to me uh, during the break, and I was very proud of her. You know, she she was well, she was kind of excited because she said she has six children, mashallah, and she spent so many years dropping her kids off and not being able to participate in masjid activities because she had babies to tend to. And now she's here and she's, you know, attends programs and she's so enthusiastic. I'm very proud to see that, mashallah, because she didn't forget herself. She didn't, she's fulfilling her obligations as a mother, but she's also prioritizing that, you know what, it's my time and we should do that. We should all do that. We should all, you know, feel uh, it's, that it's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always calling on us and we have to find ways to 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 respond you know like the, the hadith uh, you know uh, where he says I you know extend your hand and I'll I'll extend my arm walk to me and I'll run this is hadith Qudsi it's beautiful but where where are we are we extending our hand even or have we just you know shut down and we're just busy reading books you know fictional fantasy books you see all these people caught up in stuff. I'm like, how, you know, you, you have time to do that. <laughs> you have time. You have their Kindles, you know, they got all these books that they can't wait to read. But then they've never bothered to, to study, you know, the sciences that are going to actually, as we said, protect you in the end. If you study the diseases of the heart, you will find yourself becoming a better human being. I mean, why would that not be a priority on your list to do, you know? Watching YouTube videos of influencers and tutorials about how to be perfect and Marie Kondo and organizing your life, it's like we waste our time with all of that. And here we have our beautiful dean that's given everything that says, you want to be a good, you want to be the best human being that you can possibly be? Here it is. It's not hard. And it'll all come into place because, look, even like, you know, I, I joke about it, but like when you go shift to the next um, line, you know, Tahara, Ihsan, Marie Kondo has nothing on a Muslim who's actually following their rule, the, the, their, their tradition. Because Ihsan, doing things with Ihsan is perfection. So if you want to organize your life, just follow the example of your you know, of our tradition, which teaches you to do, to be clean and to, to take 
you know, organizing and doing things meticulously, ihsan, itqan, seriously. That's Islam. Islam teaches us that. We don't need these gurus to teach us things, you know. We don't need to look to people in modern life as being, you know, like that we strive for their way when our tradition already teaches us those things. That's what's, that's what's sad. So, you know, again, going back to this, the second list, sorry. You want to be a person who's achieved success and has high self-esteem? Just look, it's all Islam, genuineness, being a truthful, honest person. This was the Prophet ﷺ, Sadiq al-Amin. He was the most truthful, the most trustworthy, just, just a transparent, true person. Not, uh, doesn't have, you know, two faces, doesn't lie to you and then, you know, behind your back say this about you. Astaghfirullah, that's all, you know, it's all part of modern life. But Islam teaches you how to be a genuine person. Fear Allah. <laughs> so what it is. You fear Allah, you're not going to talk about people. If you truly fear Allah, you're not going to make riba about people and, and uh, think bad, harbor bad feelings and have rancor in your heart. Because you fear Allah. It's genuinely like... It's there, but all of that is, is taught by our faith. Forgiveness. Being a more forgiving person. This is, again, so much a part of our tradition. How many hadith, how many ayahs in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us to be merciful and compassionate and to forgive those who have wronged us, even if you have, you know, if you're in the right, it's better for you. Because when you're more forgiving, you will get what the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? When you're more compassionate with people, you will get the compassion of Allah and mercy of Allah. All of this our tradition teaches us, right? Internal values. What are we talking about? This is this whole discussion is about having that, you know, conscience that constantly tells you, you know, to be better, to strive to be better. All of those values that are coming from your own self. You don't need someone else to tell you what to do because you know your purpose. Allah subhanahu, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for a reason. All of that, again, is reinforced constantly in our faith. You read the Quran, it's, it's constantly told to us what our purpose is, why we were created, and, and to strive for certain goals. But all of that is, is, again, within our tradition, positivity, just being a good person, smiling, you know, meeting people with, with cheerfulness. This is all, if you read the descriptions of the Prophet I sent them, read them. Read, read them from the Shama'il or from, from Qadiriyyad, Shifa. Read how he was with people. He greeted people always with a cheerful disposition, smiling, happy to see people, exuding positivity, you know, spreading the salam, smile. All of that is his sunnah. So again, you know, we... we we wonder, like I said, why we're not fulfilled and why we're not happy, but the answers are right in front of us. If only we took our faith more seriously and if only we realized its value, that it actually isn't just a strict set of rules and you know things that we have to follow. It is literally the formula of achieving satisfaction in this world and protecting yourself from harm. That is Islam, right? And the last one, self-improvement. Again, constantly seeing yourself as someone who needs improvement and, you know, you're a work in progress. So those are the qualities of someone who's, who has, you know, a high sense of self-worth. We can all achieve that. And, and, and it's important to, again, see the contrast because a lot of people are stuck on the left. They're stuck on, all, on one or two or maybe all of those areas. Trust me, like this is a, it's a problem in the world now. It's not even just our community. Uh, everybody's, you know, just feeling these low, like low, uh, you know, they're just not feeling happy in life. Low reports of, you know, satisfaction with whatever, their job, they're not happy with their relationships, their children, their spouses, their homes, their cars, their clothing. It's like, <laughs> there's no happiness. Well, you know, we have to question why that is. You know, and, and, and how can we protect ourselves? Because when you look at the happiest people on the planet, the research is also interesting. Some of them have nothing, right? Some of the happiest, most content people 
are people who are not materialistically uh, wealthy. They don't have a lot, but subhanAllah, you see them. You know, I just came from Umrah, you know, about a month or so ago. You see people, mashallah, they are visibly poor. You can tell. Their clothing, they have, you know, dirt on their faces and their fingernails. They just, they probably have a very difficult life. But subhanAllah, they are smiling, you know, ear to ear, grinning. We had people coming up to us, offering us dates and bread and candy, like just randomly, you know. But if you look at them, they don't look like they have a lot. But they're so, subhanAllah, just happy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them rida. And that is why the only source of true happiness is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can go and try to find it everywhere else. Uh, if you think those are the things that are going to give you happiness. But they're not going to if you overlook Allah. It's just not going to happen. You will not find contentment. So the d only source is Allah. Everything else is just, uh, you know, again, a gift from him, a blessing from him, a means, uh, you know, but it's not the source. The source is him. So um, this last, you know, list there I wanted to share are qualities that we should all be striving for because if we want you know true happiness we also have to realize it's on us we have to do our part we can't just expect it to fall in our laps yes mm -hmm. yes that's a good question fear and hope um, well, you know, from an Islamic perspective, that's tawakkal. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, that's taqwa, excuse me. That's taqwa. So the taqwa is fear and hope. And that is absolutely a sign of, of someone who's got, you know, high self-esteem. Because if you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't, um, you, you know, you don't get too ahead of yourself where you think, you know, everything you're doing is perfect and you're, you've got it made. That's where the fear element you know, keeps you humble, right? It keeps you humble that, you know what? No, at any point, uh, Allah can take me. And that's why we make dua for a good ending because we don't know, you know, you could be praying right now and believing in this moment, but God forbid you do something. And there's hadith that mention all of this, you know, that, that there, a person can be doing a lot of good, but then they do one thing. And that's what actually ends up leading to their demise. So fear is to keep us humble, and then hope is to also f f protect us from despair. Because people who are hopeless, you know, and in despair, this is a weak state of Iman. Because this, our deen is not a deen of hopelessness. Our deen is a deen of absolute hope. And that's why we have phenomenal stories that are trying to get that message through to us. Like the man who killed 99 people. <laughs> I mean, there's no other, other story that I can think of right now that should give anybody hope more than that story. If you don't know that story, look it up. It's a story about a man who literally is a mass murderer. He murdered 99 people, but he wanted to redeem himself and basically become a better person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him hope. And it's a beautiful story. I don't want to ruin it for you, but look it up. Because that's the kind of story that wherever you are should make you feel like, you know, things will get better. And I just have to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It could possibly. I mean, I don't want to assume that everybody who's anxious has necessarily, you know, we, we shouldn't make assumptions, but anxiety is something we should seek protection from. You know, the Prophet sent him, there's du'as where he's actually asking Allah to, uh, you know, protect us from anxiety. So it's something that can plague you and, and, you know, affect your heart, and it might chip away at your quality of life. You know, um, there are people who have, you know, real disorders that are, you know, very serious, and it definitely affects their quality of life. Uh, so I think, you know, um, and then there's other people who can manage, but I think, you know, those are all, uh, you know, they're gonna, they're subjective, so it's hard to, to really say. But at the end of the day, when you want to see, you know, what is our, <laughs> so sweet, you have something to say? <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, if you want to see where do you want to be, you want to be free from all of that, right? So how can I be free from all of those things? 
Well, that's what that last list is for. It's to tell us, well, let's look at the qualities that we need to inculcate in order to gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The first one is tawbah. So wherever you are, all of us, we should be making tawbah constantly. And, you know, saying astaghfir, you know, 100 times, 70 times, however many times a day, you should, we should be doing that. It's a matter of practice. After every salah, you should be conscious of the fact that you sin. We sin every day. Nobody is free of sin. We all sin today. We all did something we shouldn't have done, either with intent, which may Allah really forgive us if we did something harm, harmful with intent, or we didn't do something we should have done. And maybe there was no intent, it was just negligence. But either way, we have to accept that you can't, you know, that we're held accountable for those things. You know, if you're, like I said, watching a show and then you miss your prayer, you're going to be held accountable for that. That's just a fact. Right? So there's certain things you just have to, you know, keep real. Yes, you have a question or a comment? Sure, I'm going to translate every single one of them. Thank you so much. The first one is Toba, and Toba means repentance. So repenting for the, you know, whatever you've done, which is what we just mentioned, right? If you've made any mistakes today, uh, just make tawbah. And remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He loves, this is really, again, something you should just stick in your mind. Allah loves the tawab more than the perfect servant. Okay? I'll say it again. He loves the one who sins but keeps coming back for tawbah. And not to say you're making the same sin and you keep thinking like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, no, you don't. It's a matter of like, I keep slipping and falling and I'm weak and I, you know, but Allah, I know that you're the most forgiving. You have this hope that you're constantly, you know, uh, manifesting by returning to him. You are more beloved to Allah in that state than if you were to just do everything perfectly. We have to know these things. So the, to repent, it might sound like, oh, it's this negative thing, but it's not. It's actually a beautiful thing to make toba. It's a beautiful recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ubudiyah, like your ubudiyah, right? That you are a servant to, to him. You're recognizing his lordship over you. And that's why you make tawbah, right? So it's a beautiful thing. Don't make it like this shame thing. Internal shame, by the way, is good, you know? Nobody needs to know your sins. You don't need to go around broadcasting what you've done. No, it's between you and Allah. Astaghfirullah, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I, I did this again. But you're so forgiving. Please forgive me, you know? That's, that's what you do. And you just have hope. And you, inshallah, work on yourself, right? And that's why the Prophet said, every son of Adam sins, and the best of those who sin are those who repent. So the best of, of, of all of us are the people who make uh, tawbah. Um, and many other, many other hadith. This one actually is a really good one. Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave than a person who has his camel in a desert carrying all of his food and drink and it is lost. Having lost all hope to get that back, this person lies down in the shade and is disappointed and heartbroken about his camel when all of a sudden he finds out that the camel is standing before him. He takes hold of its reins and then out of boundless joy blurts out, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Rabb. He commits this mistake out of extreme joy, right? But the point of this hadith is like, he's more pleased with Tawbah, with our Tawbah, than su such a person. And we all have been there. We've all lost something, right? And we've like, oh my God. And then you know when you find it, that joy, right? Like the joy that you feel after losing something that you thought you lost, like whether it's your engagement ring, wedding ring, or like whatever it is, some valuable thing, and then you find it, you're like, oh my God! You know, but Allah SWT is more pleased with, with us when we make tawbah than, than that feeling that we have, right? So just think about that. It's all to encourage us. Tahara, the next word is purification. We have to keep ourselves clean, and this is why going back to what I said earlier, you know, fardain, which is compulsory knowledge, it's what every single Muslim should know. 
there are certain things that we should know. One of them is to know how to clean yourself because it's such a big part of being a Muslim that we maintain a level of cleanliness, right? And not just for ourselves and our bodies, but in our spaces. And yes, even in public spaces, we should be practicing cleanliness. When you go to a restaurant or anywhere, even a hotel, like why do you need to use five towels just because they're there? Like, did you see that's like, right? Why? Why do that? Why throw your garbage like everywhere? You know, sometimes they have a can by the table. There's a garbage can in the bathroom. Like we have to think about these things. Why am I a messy person in someone else's space just because there's people that are going to clean up after me? This isn't, that's not right. A good per a person is conscious of these things, right? Like I don't want to, you know, I want to have a small, like leave a small footprint when I go somewhere, right? The believers are what? Those who are tread lightly on the earth. You shouldn't, you see people, they destroy hotel rooms. Like, I don't get that at all. Be like, you know, minimal. Like, you know, like, you know, don't make such a big giant mess for people. Or you see people, and I've seen restaurants where Muslims do this. They'll a whole family, and it's just junk all over the table. And then they just walk out. That's like horrible. Is that, I mean, how would we do that really? Like, if someone did that to us, how would we feel? Like, they came, we invited them to eat, and they just thrashed the, the, the table, bones, chicken bones everywhere, sauce spilled, and then they go, they just like, salam alaikum, and they leave. Like, who does that? Nobody does that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, of course. Absolutely. This is a slap. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. 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 Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's heartbreaking stuff for a lot. This is, a, it's a, weddings, conferences, everywhere you go. Even we just, you know, we did Umrah. We saw it uh, there. May Allah forgive us. There's a lot of Israf. Israf is when you are, you know, you overindulge. And then you you do that. You know, you, you're wasteful. So we have to, you know, seek refuge from Allah. Because these are all things that if you're following, again, the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, you don't do those things. Because you have a conscience that tells you that's wrong. It's wrong to throw away. Like if you eat, I agree, I've seen it. It's like you know, a sandwich and someone will have a bite of their sandwich and, and they just throw it away or half of, of the sandwich. Cut, cut, just take a knife, cut off the portion, right? And like you said, if you go step outside, you might be able to, you know, give it to someone who's in need or, you know, Save it for lunch the next day, but like you don't need to just toss it. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And nobody does that at home, right? We're like over the faucet with, you know, turn, turn on, the, the water's too much, right? With our kids, with everybody else, we're very conscious about our own spending because we're going to have to pay that bill, you know, but we do, this is all a part of, you know, your, you have to ask yourself, like, Allah's watching you at all times. How do you, you know, do that in good conscience? And it should, you know, but again, if you're not thinking about these things and it's just like, oh, everybody else is doing it, it's okay, I'll do it, and I'm just, you know, going to go along, then, you know, where is that, you know, internal values, you know, number five, where you, you have your own set of uh, rules that you live by. That's what Islam should teach you. So tahara is very big, you know, and this is also important. The key, the Prophet ﷺ said that the key to the prayer is cleanliness, its beginning is takbir, and its ending is salam. Our prayer, you know, wudu is very important. It's an act of worship. We have to take wudu seriously we, and try to be 
as mindful as possible. And if we're just, you know, splashing water and having showers in the, in the sink and going through it really quickly just because we have to go, rush, 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 that's a time management problem. You shouldn't be rushing your will do because you're likely going to rush your prayer. And if you're rushing your will do and you're rushing your prayer, what are you spending your time on, right? Because not everything is getting rushed. And that's where you have to sit back and go, hmm, yeah, I took, you know, a long time doing X, Y, Z activity. And it was, you know, I shopped around. I went to this store and that store. But then I rushed all those things. Like, where are my priorities, right? Maybe I didn't manage my time well enough. So this is where this muhasaba, this constant conversation comes back where you look at yourself and I need to be better, right? So the next one is taqwa, okay? And this is, you know, piety. It's, it's having that balance of fear and hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but always remembering that He is with you at all times. And that is what motivates you to be the best person that you can be. Uh, the Prophet said, or Abu Hurairah actually narrated that the Messenger of Allah was once asked by someone which people were admitted into paradise the most. And he said, the people of taqwa and good character. They go hand in hand. Okay, if you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will have good character. And this is the predominance of people in Jannah. This is the qualities that they will have, right? And then he was also asked in the same hadith about people who are admitted into the fire the most. And he said, those who are, um, those who, sorry, this is not translated properly. Yeah, it's, it's referring to the people who are too uh, loose with their mouth and their private parts, okay? So we know that from the hadith that these are the people of, of Jahannam is those who are irresponsible with their mouth, which is many things, right? They talk too much, they make claims they shouldn't, they lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they make riba, they, you know, they lie in general. There's a lot of bad things that you can do with your mouth. And then private parts, this is, you know, again, being out um, of you know, just not you know, promiscuous, doing lewd things. This is all over our, our societies now, right? We see it everywhere. But the, these are the people that will make up the people of Jahannam. And then uh, he, Ibn Umar said that whoever has taqwa of his Lord and maintains, maintains ties of kinship, his life will be prolonged, his wealth will be abundant, and his family will love him. And the Prophet also said, have taqwa of Allah wherever you are and follow an evil deed with a good one to wipe it out and treat the people with good behavior. So that was a concept. I mean, there's so many hadith. These are just short, uh, little, a few samples of them, but enough to get th that across, that these are qualities we have to inculcate. We have to have consciousness of Allah and, um, and make sure that we're acting always with good character. Ihsan, what we talked about earlier, goodness and perfection. You know, Allah loves uh, those who do things and they do things well, right? And it's actually, in, um, you know, the Prophet said that Allah has prescribed that we do things with ihsan in everything that we do. So whenever we do something, that we try our best to make it the best effort possible. We don't turn in things or produce things that are half-hearted or done with, you know, very minimal effort. So take your time, right? You know, take your time doing things. Don't rush, right? Ajalam in a shaitan. When you're rushing through something, you're likely going to make mistakes and its quality goes down. So again, though, you know, getting into practice of these things is how we um, we gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. Tawakkal, trust in Allah, right? Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. Um, Umar ibn al-Khattab said that he heard, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, if you all depend on Allah, with due reliance, he would certainly give you provision as he gives it to the birds who go forth hungry in the morning and return with full bellies at dusk. So just having this absolute certainty that, you know what, no matter what, Allah is going to take care of me. Like, I just, you just have to believe that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, you know, will either, especially if you have a need, you know, ask for your need, but know that if it's given, withheld from you, uh, in this dunya, there's a reason for that. Likely it's not good enough for you, and inshallah he will 
replace it with something better, or he's waiting for the next life to reward you. But either way, in every circumstance, you have to have this deep conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants the best for you. And not to let uh, dunya or circumstances uh, make you question that ever. As soon as you start questioning that, it's a problem, right? That, oh, is this, you know, that, that you start losing your, your trust in him, that's a, that's a serious issue. But this is, again, something we all have to work on. Justice, you know, being a person who's just and fair, um, you know, in all of your transactions with people, uh, just in every situation, you're just always looking for the, to, to be a fair person. This is a very important uh, quality that we should all inculcate, inshallah. Um, and then the last one is sabr. Uh, and, you know, again, there's different types of patience, but the real patience, the Prophet ﷺ said, is at the stroke, at the beginning of a calamity. So when something happens to you that is like, like the teacher that I described, that is the perfect example of Sabrun Jameen, right? His wife had just died, but why was he able to show so much patience where he could actually go and give a, le a class, even though his, her body hasn't yet been prayed over? I mean, we just have to think. What can, you know, because he had... He followed his deen. He realized it was her time. Obviously, the pain and the sorrow and the, all the hardships are going to come. You can't escape it. You know, you're going to grieve. But when you realize something happens that's out of your control and that you didn't expect, your response has to be patience. Like, Allah, it's your decree. And I can't, you know, uh, fight it or be mad and angry about it. So these are all, you know, qualities, again, of, of, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and that we should all strive to have. Okay? Are there any questions? I know it's, you guys have to pick up your kids. Any questions? Is there anything anybody wants to add? Number six? Adil, Adil is, uh, is justice. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, go over, I did some English, some Arabic, but yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, Jazakallah khair, and we'll end in dua. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa maulana habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa al-asr inna l-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabah. Jazakum wa khair, and thank you so much.